What's up, True Seekers? Welcome everyone back to the show. My name is TJ Hale. I'm really excited to have you here today. We've got a very intellectual and stimulating chat. My guest is actually a professor at Hillsdale College, and he's the founder of the co-founder, I should say, of the Imaginative Conservative. Uh, he's written a book called In Defense of Andrew Jackson. And uh, as all of you know, and as you, since you went to public school like I did, you know that Andrew Jackson was a horrible man, a slave-owning, bigoted, probably homophobic, we don't know for sure, hater that should be erased from the annals of human history and definitely purged from the $20 bill. And I found the craziest man alive who's actually going to defend him and say that those things maybe are not true and should not happen. So Dr. Bradley Berzer, Take courage. Give me your best stuff. How are you? Uh, good morning, TJ. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. I, I, I'm not sure about that homophobic part. Uh, I'm, he must be. I, I mean, he checks all the other boxes. That, that Jackson ever even thought of. But anyway, yes, the other the other challenges are all worthy ones, certainly. So can thank we just, you so much can for we having Can we just agree on. that he's privileged then? I mean, maybe not homophobic, but white privilege, certainly. Well, yes, born into poverty, lost his family by the time he was 13. But I, I guess because he was white, he was privileged, but it, it took a lot. So, yes. You know, can we can we talk about that for a second? This idea of privilege. Sure. I had a buddy on Facebook. I just I want to get your thoughts on it, who was talking about um, he's an old friend that I follow every now and then. And he said, sure. I'm just as a privileged white guy, I'm very distressed and broken up about what is happening. Blah, 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 whatever it was in the news. And I don't know if you've been following these guys that are um, kind of exposing the corruption in academia. I think his name is Mike Nenya. Yeah. Have you seen this? Oh, right. Yes. Oh, those three people who've been, yeah, they're amazing, actually. I, I'm just fascinated by the fact that they said that for several months they were doing this experiment and they were right. failing and they were going to quit because it wasn't working. And then they switched up the mode and realized the magic word is privilege. And I just thought how yeah. pervasive and pernicious that is that no matter what they talked about, if they dressed yes. it in the backdrop of privilege, it just greenlit all the way through. People went nuts over it. What are your thoughts on that, being an academic? Well, I, my, my own sense, TJ, and of course, I'm just giving you my opinion here, sure. but it, it's fascinating to me. I, I graduated from college in 1990, and that was right. It was about my junior year, sometime about 1988, 89, that I started seeing people using the term politically correct. And so that was just starting. And I thought, oh, this has got to be a fad. It's not going to go anywhere. And I was already a, I was a very serious libertarian and a Catholic at that time. And I just okay. and still am a still am a Catholic, more conservative probably than libertarian now. But I, I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is uh, this is insane. And now here we are. You know, I'm coming up my 30th college anniversaries in two years. And this thing, this thing just seems to be pervasive. And I, I find it almost criminal uh, because it is obviously a way to be utterly bigoted and yet to be sanctioned as an OK bigot to decry people for having privilege. Yeah, you know, I certainly I don't know about your background, TJ, but both sides of my family came here with very little and had to work to do everything to be able to make it anywhere. And granted, I'm I'm white, but uh, I I'm not convinced that that really gave them an edge. Uh, and I, I also think it's actually, and you you asked a wide open question, TJ, and you can tell me to shut up at any moment. No, I think it also is actually incredibly discriminatory to anyone who's not white because it's basically suggesting that because they're not white, they failed. And I, it's just horrible in every way. So I'm, I'm very against this whole notion of privilege. Uh, privilege exists, obviously, but it's more of a power relationship than it is class or race, I think. Yeah, I just for me, and I'm reading this, and I had a little epiphany. You know, you have those insights as you're as you're doing things. I thought, here's my friend who, in some ways in life, is a completely broken person, but still has right. this superficial idea of privilege because of something he had no control over. Yeah. and to me, that's yeah, what's really absolutely. sad about it. Yeah, I, I think it's a uh, so much, and, and I'm sure there's a viable debate about this, TJ. But it just strikes me that so much of the Western tradition over the last hundred years has been a move in every way against free will. So we just keep denying more and more what we can do and what we can choose. And everything becomes in some way the product of environment or skin color or whatever it is. And it's just dangerous. <laughs> it's just not healthy for a society. Uh, I, don't, I also don't think it's true, but it is really dangerous. Yeah, one of the themes lately uh, for the last couple of interviews has been this idea of reconciliation and how great men are able to reconcile things that they can mm. see will sow seeds of discord. But with that theme in right. mind, let's talk about sure. this book. So you're a professor at Hillsdale College. 
Yeah. Um, and you wrote a book in defense of Andrew Jackson. In the book, you actually state that he is one of your top four presidents of all time. And I thought, this can't be right. This isn't what I learned in school. <laughs> Where do we yeah. want to start with? I mean, what, what made you, what gave you the impetus to write the book about Mr. Jackson? Well, so I've been teaching a course that we have here at Hillsdale that's called Jacksonian America. And I, I teach it actually with my, you guys can see me, I'm pointing to my next door neighbor, David Rainey and I. Uh, shift and we both teach American Revolution, Jacksonian America, and then the American Civil War. So I've been here for 19 years and I've been teaching that course, Jacksonian America, which goes roughly from Jefferson's embargo in 1807 up until the end of the Mexican War in 1848. So it's one of these time periods that I'm absolutely fascinated with. You get the Second Great Awakening. Of course, we have the War of 1812. We get really interesting figures, everyone from Frederick Douglass to Daniel Boone to Nathaniel Hawthorne, just some really amazing people living, very eccentric, interesting figures in that time period. And I had always been, really up until about three or four years years ago, I had really been a Jackson skeptic. I had thought very highly of Jackson in the War of 1812. In fact, I don't, I think even the person who may just despise Jackson, you have to still give him credit for what he did at the Battle of New Orleans, sure. which is extraordinary. But I, I certainly had no sympathy at all with him on many of his government policies, and especially in his opinion towards the American Indians. But I, so two years ago, I got a call from Harry Crocker, it's a great guy, head of Rignery Publishing. And because of the interest that Trump had in Jackson, Harry Crocker was interested in someone who could write biography and someone who was a historian to take a second look at Jackson. And I, I told him, I said, I'm not very pro Jackson, but I'm happy to do this as long as you allow me to kind of, you know, basically say what's good and what's bad about him. And he did. He was great. And I started reading about Jackson. And the more I came to read about him specifically from him, not just not just what people were saying about him, but what he actually said and looking at the documents and the policies he had, two things hit me right away, TJ. Uh, one, this is the most violent guy I've ever met in <laughs> academic study. And two, he's got to be the single most honest person I've ever met. I, I was astounded by how honest he was. And... I just I couldn't get over that. And I kind of as much as I disagree with a lot of things he did and a lot of his policies, I can't help but respect him for his honesty. Uh, he never, never lied that I could find. He didn't fudge the truth. Uh, he might kill you, but he would tell you right before he did it. He was going to do it. <laughs> I'm not saying that's good, but it, there's no sneakiness to him. There's nothing Machiavellian about him. He really was exactly what he said he was. And I, I came to admire that even when I disagreed with a lot of what he did. I'm working on two books, and the first one's called So You're a Procrastinator. But if I get to the second one, it's going to have a chapter about how we need to bring back the duel. Uh, because this threat <laughs> of fear and bodily harm had a way of making people honest. I listened to a podcast a couple of years ago with James Altucher, and he was talking to this real-life drug dealer, this American um, Escobar. And the guy was saying, look, it, what I, and what I did, and he goes, there's no honor among thieves and what I did was not good. But mm -hmm. he goes, you didn't, you didn't need lawyers. You didn't need police officers. <laughs> you had your word. And if you didn't keep it, you died. He goes, it's really simple. Yeah. So when you read about, uh, I think it was, I was reading um, Black Liberals and White, Re no, White Rednecks and Black Liberals. Sorry, I have the title wrong. It's Thomas Sowell's book about Southern culture. I think that was the I first time. That. I bet uh, it's great. Uh, well, it's the first time I read about the, Jackson's mother's quote about how she oh, said yeah. that you should use the courts unless it's for slander. Yes. You should take care of that, that stuff yourself. And I just stopped right. and laughed out loud because that kind of, doesn't that sum that's up right. why he was so violent? He just took care of his own issues. Yeah. You know, TJ, it's amazing. I'm not Scotch Irish at all. Uh, my wife's at McDonald's. She's half Scot Scotch Irish, so I tease her a lot. But I always tell my students. Wait, time out. That Have you done a DNA test? Like, are you might are you 99.99% not Scotch Irish? I'm nothing. Um, oh, zero. I, I mean, okay. I'm actually something. I, I did do a DNA test. What am I? I'm 70% uh, German and then a whole bunch of British, for, uh, Italian, Spanish, and Scandinavian. No Cherokee? No Dakota? Yeah. Okay. No, I have no, not like Elizabeth Warren, I have no Native American blood in me. I'm 100% I'm European ancestry. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting so, your train of thought. My wife is Scotch-Irish, so how about so, you, TJ? So you know all about uh, settling issues yourself? 
I don't. Yes. Like well, yeah. So my wife, I tease her about this, but I always tell my students if they really want to understand the uniqueness of Scotch Irish culture in America, they have to watch the Disney movie Brave because the the guys in that show have you seen it tj i've seen bits and pieces it's on frequently in the living room it's a great movie actually i love it but the guys are total idiots and it's actually and they're they're hilarious and they're violent and it really fits scotch irish culture it's it's like there really is a truth and and believe me i have admiration for scotch irish culture but it was intensely violent and you're absolutely right as as Jackson's mother told him, you know, real men never settle things in court. They settle them on the street. And Jackson took that to heart. No question about it. Yeah, it was White Liberals and Black Rednecks. Excellent book by Soul. That's that's Soul? Yeah. Have you I read that book? I haven't read that. I'll have to check that out. So, I mean, you're you're a history buff. I know that for me, he talks about Southern culture and a lot of things that we attribute to rednecks and, you know, black poor culture sure. in the South actually are from the people who emigrated from certain areas of Scotland and Ireland. Oh, that, absolutely. From, from burning yeah. crosses to, to uh, mob violence. Anyway, um, absolutely. You, you talked about Trump and the way this all started with being asked by Regner to write the book. For those right. who are not familiar with Trump's uh, affinity for Jackson, let's talk about that a little bit. How did that happen? Sure. So I... Uh, Yeah, Trump doesn't play a huge role in my book. It was really more that when he praised him and especially to look at his birthday at that big 200th anniversary, which would have been uh, of his birth, right, 250th anniversary, which would have been last year. Trump gave a really good speech. And I'm fairly positive that it was one of my former students who's now a speechwriter for Trump who actually wrote that speech. Uh, her name's Brittany Baldwin. She's a wonderful graduate from Hillsdale and is now doing very well in the Trump administration. But nice it, job, doctor. Nice job. Yeah, no, she's fantastic. I think the world of her. <laughs> I absolutely think the world of her. But anyway, I'm pretty sure that that's where it came from. But that's why Harry at Regnery was interested, because you know, here comes Jackson really had not been praised since Reagan. And here he's brought back into the public arena. And of course, there was a lot of discussion at the time because Trump made two claims. Number one, that he's a modern Jackson. And number two, he made the claim, which I actually think Trump was absolutely right, that if Jackson had been president instead of James Buchanan, we wouldn't have had the Civil War. Uh, And I people mocked him for that. But it makes perfect sense to me that Jackson, you know, we saw what Jackson did when South Carolina tried to nullify a law. Jackson would have none of it. And he stopped it immediately. So now we could argue whether that's good or bad. Uh, And I said, one of my close friends is Tom Woods. And I'm sure Tom would disagree with me strongly on this because he's a big nullification guy. But regardless, just historically, I think it's true that Jackson stopped it 30 years earlier. And he would have done the same thing in 1860 and 61 if he had had the chance. Let's uh, so we're going to get a varied assortment of history buffs in the comments, and I'm sure some of them will sure. play the Tom Woods card and, and pick things. Oh, apart. yeah. But for those who are less familiar with Jackson and maybe only know the myths about the man, let's kind of tackle some of those. You mentioned nullification. We can sure. talk about the banks. We can talk about Florida. Yeah. Of course, the Indians. Let's kind of pick, yeah. pick those apart and, and add some context to some of those decisions and why he's such a horrible person. historically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So just stop me, TJ. Jump in whenever you want me to uh, to stop. I don't, I don't want to lecture here Send too it. much. Send it. Yeah, well, so, you know, Jackson enters the public scene. He's born in 1767, and he enters the public scene really at, at the age of 12 and 13. He's a, he's a soldier. He serves as a soldier and a messenger during the Revolutionary War, and he's deeply wounded by a British officer a wound that stays with him for the rest of his life. And his mother's killed because she's a nurse, uh, nursing revolutionary soldiers. She catches typhus or some kind of, I don't remember what exactly, but dies. So he's lost his dad, he's lost his brothers, and he's the only one left at age 13 and has nothing, nothing in the world at all. But he makes his way up. He moves out to Nashville, Tennessee, when it's just arriving on the scene and becomes kind of a patriarch there. So by the 1790s, he's known across America. He makes his position best known. He serves in the Senate, U.S. Senate. 
but he makes his position best known as the leader of the Tennessee militia. And uh, there's a whole backstory to this, TJ, but up until about the 18, well, really until about 1863, we don't have a regular standing army. Uh, we have certain groups that have sanctioned by Congress, and then we have lots and lots of militias. And it's very hard to go back and say, oh, this was the U.S. military versus a private army. And Jackson walked that line. He was, you never quite knew if this was his private army or the U.S. military, but he was incredibly successful. So his great defeat of the British on January 8th of 18. 1815 is what made him an international figure. And so then once he has this victory in the war of 1812, he's elected president in 1824, but it's a contentious election and it's thrown to John Quincy Adams instead of Andrew Jackson. Then he comes back in 1828 and he's elected. And the policies that he implements when he's elected, there are really three that I think are controversial. Uh, number one, he gets the Indians removed from their original eastern lands to west of the Missouri River out in Kansas and Nebraska. That's one of his main platforms. Number two, he is an incredible free market guy. And he takes down the Bank of the United States and gets us back on gold and silver as a currency, private currency, a competitive currency as opposed to what we had. The third thing he does is he basically fires all the bureaucrats who existed in Washington, D.C. and brings in his own people. So those are the three things that he's best known for in his presidency. And that's you know, people either love him or hate him for all three of those things. But that's what he's certainly known for. I'm thinking a lot about Columbus Day recently. I was going to do a video on it. Sure. I know Prager, Indigenous you, People's you, Day, right? Yes. Yeah. As uh, Hugo <laughs> Chavez has in, uh, made famous. <laughs> Sure. Oh, it frustrates me. But it's funny. I was online trolling a little bit. And uh, how many people I, I criticized one guy for going along with a popular narrative. And he said, no, this is not. I've just studied my history and I've learned a lot of things about Columbus that disturb me. And mm. uh, I was thinking, you know, if you go back in time, the people that built the statues, the people that reverenced them, the people that wanted to remember the things they did knew them sure. a lot better than we do. They lived a lot closer to their time. So as I was reading your book, right. Jackson was a contemporary of most of the revolutionary founding fathers, which is fascinating. Oh, yeah. He was born just before, what, in the eight, 1760s? Is that right? Yeah, 67, right? Born in 67. So he actually, he's 12 and 13 at the end of the war when he's fighting. Actually right. shoots. We know he shoots. Uh, I mean, he's, he's wielding a gun. He shot first. So he was in battle. Uh, and then there's some of the things you wrote that I just I made highlights of. One was, you said, in one of the stranger twists of American intellectual history, it was liberals who rushed to embrace him. Even yeah. though Jackson was an economic libertarian who would have found the New Deal unsound and yeah. dangerous to constitutional liberty, he loved the Constitution. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. He is. Uh, I mean, I think we could disagree with him. We could even be constitutionalists and say he misinterpreted it. But what he does as president, he is very concerned. And I, I was not sympathetic to this before I read his arguments. So really, I've only come to his way of thinking in the last two years or so. Okay. So his view was that really from about Thomas Jefferson up through John Quincy Adams, so presidents two up through six, he's number seven, that there had become way too comfortable of a relationship between the president and especially the Senate. And that the president really saw the Senate as kind of his cabinet and the Senate saw the president as kind of their prime minister. And there's no doubt, for example, the Bank of the United States, one of the reasons the second bank succeeded was because as it was created in 1816, it gave shares, private shares of the bank to sitting congressmen, both in the Senate and the House. So they had an absolute incentive to keep this thing going, even though it's a public-private corporation. And Jackson said, this can't happen. This There cannot be this kind of agreement and comfortableness between those two branches of government. So Arthur Schlesinger, 100 years later, when he's trying to promote Franklin Roosevelt, he says, look, we have a model and a strong executive. We're going to go back and revive Jackson as this great presidential leader, someone who understood the president should be powerful. Interesting. But my understanding, and a contra uh, Schlesinger and these other New Deal historians, is that Jackson never argued that the president was supreme. What he argued was that it was equal to both the legislative and the Supreme Court. So much like John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison, 
uh, Marshall never argued the Supreme Court had supremacy on issues of constitutionality. He argued that it had equality with the other two branches. And from my read of Jackson, now I, I think this is a debatable point, TJ. And I, I if some historian said you're wrong, Berzer, I'm I'm not gonna. I, I might disagree, but I would also understand the argument. And I, I'm not gonna. I wouldn't go to the wall on this one. But I, from my reading, Jackson is purely proclaiming the equality of the executive branch, not its superiority. So I think the New Deal historians had it totally wrong, but there is a shift. And you know, I was just born, I was born in 1967, uh, amazingly 200 years after Jackson. There you go. But it's right at the end of the 1960s that the new left, opposed to their fathers, the old left, they just reverse this. And whereas the old left loved Jackson the new left sees him as the greatest demon figure of early America. He's the ultimate capitalist, imperialist, and hater of the Indians. So our modern hatred of Jackson, that all starts in the late 1960s, works its way into American history textbooks. And now, I'm sure you've seen this as well, TJ. I mean, here I write a book in defense of, which is you know, an obnoxious title. It's a marketing title. It's basically saying, sure. you know, come punch me in the face. Uh, <laughs> it's asking for a Nazi, fight. There's no yeah. question about that. But it's amazing to me how many people got onto Twitter and just said, oh, uh, Berzer must be evil to defend this guy. They hadn't read the book. They knew nothing about it. They just saw that title and they were ready to go after me because in, to most people under 25, Jackson is basically slightly better than Hitler. And that's absurd, of course. But I, I will admit I wasn't expecting that much anger either. That's been pretty shocking to me. So online hatred. Oh. I love it. Drink it up. <laughs> so much fun. It's funny when you say that because I will. I have several publishers who email uh, publicity emails. Hey, do you want to talk to this author? And I'll admit, when I saw your title, I thought, eh, it's not yep. a chat. Understood. I think I want to have. I don't Understood. like Jackson. And then yep. I started thinking. Um, Chris Rock has this skit where he goes, and I started listening because I knew, and he says something I can't say on the air after that. Yes, of course not. And I had that you moment. You never of, quote Chris Rock. Only yeah. Chris Rock can yeah. quote Chris Rock. That's our word. I can't use that word. Yeah, it has that word in there. But I had that moment where I thought, wait a minute. If everyone hates this person, this is a conversation I need to have because I don't know that yeah. much about Jackson aside from the assumptions that I believe are true that I hear others regurgitate. But more so, when Obama decided that Jackson had to come off the $20 bill, like to right. me, that's, that's right. a big thing. And I want it to understand is. why if Obama hates him, then I need to make sure I understand if I hate him for the right reasons or if there's something I'm missing. I actually have another line here I want to read from your sure. book where you said that this president promised to uphold the Constitution. By the way, I said earlier he's a fan of the Constitution. I'm sure people are pulling their hair out going, wait a minute, what about the Indians? What about the Supreme Court? So we'll right, come back to right. that. And we should talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. I might have might have uh, overspoke. But, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it said Not to, at all. To approve public works only if they were constitutionally acceptable, <clears throat> Roosevelt, to limit government spending and extinguish the national debt, hey -oh, to give preference— Which he did which is amazing to give preference yep. to the militia rather than to a standing army and yep. to follow a just and liberal policy toward the American Indians. Perhaps, perhaps most importantly, he promised reform as an essential part of his administration. He said reform will require particularly the correction of those abusers who have used patronage to put power in unfaithful or incompetent hands. The need to reform a corrupt federal government had been a consistent and popular theme of Jackson's campaign. When you talk about him eliminating the national bank, like to me, that was almost like when Trump got Apple to repatriate two billion dollars. I said if they, had, mm. if Obama had done that, they'd be lining up a Nobel Prize. They'd be building the plaque and altar that they would hand those things to him on. Those are kind of a big deal. I'm actually curious how he accomplished those things in a time yeah. when more people were voting. He was a populist president, and uh, and and he was very popular at the time. Is that what allowed him to get the things done that he needed to? Because he was running contrary yeah. to Washington. You know, he he was actually there were a lot of people who supported him more than who didn't. But there were people who hated him, too. Uh, so from the beginning, from the moment he appears on the public scene in seven in the 1790s, nobody's neutral on Jackson. Everyone either loves him or hates him. And it's course it is his victory at New Orleans that makes him more than just a great American. He becomes kind of an American demigod at that point, you know, equal to Daniel Boone or in frontier language, Natty Bumpo, leather stocking uh, that he just becomes becomes this mythic figure at that time. But I, I think it's important to note, TJ, that, and maybe 
Well, again, let me say two things. Number one, if someone disagreed with Jackson, I have no problem with that uh, at all. I think he did some terrible things. So I don't want to suggest that we should only whitewash him. I think Indian removal was wretched, right? I mean, I just think it was a wretched policy, and I think he was just dead wrong about it. Um, I I think his motives were good, but the way it worked, but we can talk about that. Yeah, you're right. Uh, So here's what happens. When he is victorious against the British at New Orleans, two very important things happen. Number one, the British for the very first time respect us, which is crazy because we just wiped them out there. Yet Jackson lost something like 30 men and the British lost something close to 4,000 men in that battle. So lopsided. And yet the British come back saying, wow, maybe we need to take these guys seriously. And it's really the beginning (laughs) of the Anglo-American alliance that lasts to this day. It starts there in Jackson's defeat of the British. So that's really important. But by defeating the British, Jackson almost single-handedly opens up the entire West between the Appalachian Mountains and the Missouri River. So all the population that votes for him, it's all that population that sweeps into the American West. So he's actually, in an ironic way, he has created his own electorate by his victories at New Orleans and during the War of 1812. These will be the very same people who love and admire him in every way. So that that will be his great support. And when he goes to Washington, he's such a powerful character that it, he just, as president, he is able to fire anyone in the executive branch he wants. And he brings in a lot of good people. The most famous person he brings in is a guy named Amos Kendall, who just starts, he puts rules on every bureaucrat basically saying you will work an eight hour day. You may not bring newspapers in because this is not your time. You are a member of this Republic and you will do your duty. Otherwise you're gone. And he monitored that monitored that. And they, it was one of the least corrupt periods in all of American history, because you've got someone like Kendall, who's just, I mean, I wouldn't want to work for him, but I would want someone to work for him, if that makes sense. Uh, he just, he watched all of that. And he was, and Jackson, through personality, as well as through really good people, was really able to clean a lot of the corruption out of DC, did a great job of doing it. And it, it's why so many people hated him too, because when he came to DC, they knew changes were coming and they were very scared. They were scared for their jobs, scared for the rules, everything. So he, he really was effective in remaking DC. Uh, A lot of historians go back and say, this was just pure politics and a spoil system. There's no doubt that's a part of it, but it also did clean house uh, without question. So I didn't know anything about Amos Kendall before I read the book. I'm very curious. So I'll, I'll give an analogous to something that I understand is when I, uh, I have some friends who own factories in China, and one of them is an older gentleman who owned uh, K2 when he was scooping mm-hmm. up all these other subsidiaries sure. and sold it. And we went to one of those factories, and they basically had a hatchet man, an Amos Kendall, on site that all the Chinese people were deathly afraid of. So my friend was a good yeah. guy, very friendly, but this hatchet man, he was an enforcer, and they were terrified of him. And I'm just wondering, was that Amos Kendall's personality, or was he just very effective in his <laughs> persuasive ability yeah. to get people to do what he wanted? It was his personality, and he was, I mean, we would call him a type A personality, certainly, but he was also, I think a lot of it has to do with, he was devoutly religious, and I think it was to go into a job and to do your thing when you should be doing the thing for the people was actually sinful. He had that kind of old puritanical Baptist notion as well that, you know, this, you, you are not given these gifts for your own self benefit. You're given them to work for the Republic. And I, I think there's a really religious impetus there. Jackson had that too. Uh, Jackson's a Presbyterian and uh, he becomes more Presbyterian as he gets older, but there's no doubt that that shapes him his whole life that real protestant work ethic is huge for him so if anyone's watching that does hate jackson and they're wondering why we're schlepping for him here let's talk about some of the things that he is rightfully sure. known for that were bad uh, yeah. supreme court indians where do we want to start with this what things did you yeah really screw so up on? Uh, 
I think two things we could never excuse him for. Uh, we can put him in context, but he's wrong. Number one, he's a slave owner. And uh, that, of course, is true for so many people of that era. But he does in many ways make his reputation based on his slaves who are very effective as a plantation economy. And now he is you know, within the evil of slavery. And I think anyone in 2018, no one's going to defend it, nor should we. It's an evil institution. But within that institution, there are there are variations. You've got some slaveholders who treat their slaves relatively well, others who are just as abusive as the imagination will allow us to, to think of. And Jackson was on the spectrum of treating his slaves pretty well. Uh, not always. If someone ran away from his plantation, he saw that as betrayal, and he was very harsh in his punishment. But certainly, even when he's in the White House, he leaves his favorite uh, the favorite uh, person that he has among his slaves, a young woman named Hannah, he leaves her completely in charge of a whole farm for the eight years he's in D.C. So he doesn't get a white person. He doesn't have an overseer. He turns it over to this slave Hannah. And you know that that's fascinating, I think, in all kinds of ways. Indians are a much more difficult issue. And the reason is because we often, and I've seen this, because Jackson had so many Indians removed, he's called an ethnic cleanser. I will freely admit that removal was a wretched, wretched policy of the Americans. Yeah. Uh, we know that, for example, when the Choctaws, one of the great tribes of the South, that when they are forcibly removed under Jackson's rule, under his orders in 1830 and 31, they lose, uh, they, they start out with about 18,000 Indians leaving Alabama and Georgia in the South. And en route to Oklahoma, about one out of every three die because of the conditions that they're moving in. And when they arrive in Oklahoma, so they've lost a third of their tribe. When they arrive at Oklahoma in the winter, none of the supplies they've been promised are there. And about another one out of two die in the next few months. Wow. So imagine in 1830, we've got 18,000 Choctaw. In 1831, there are only roughly 6,000 left. So that's huge. That's, that's unacceptable, horrible. right? I mean, that's just unacceptable by any standard. So we can blame Jackson for that. Now, why does he do it? That's where it gets more complicated. Jackson doesn't have a racist bone in his body that I found when it came to Indians. There were certain Indians he loved, certain Indians he hated, others he was fairly neutral about. We do know that he never once attacked an Indian woman or child. He had very strict rules on war that when American soldiers went into battle against the Indians, they could only hit soldiers, that is fellow soldiers, the Indians, Indian males, never women or children. He adopted an Indian child after one battle because the mother was going to commit ritual suicide. So one of his children was Indian. Uh, when he fought at the Battle of New Orleans, about a third of his forces were Indians who were his friends, his allies, and they stayed with him for a very long time. They were not removed ultimately. And when the Indian policy of removal is put into place, Jackson's argument, and I think we can agree or disagree with him, but his argument was Look, if we allow the Choctaws or the Cherokees or the Chickasaws or the Creeks to remain in the South, they are being so outpopulated by their southern neighbors that they will be decimated as a people within a generation. Therefore, we remove them to Oklahoma and Kansas out of harm's way and they'll be safe. That was his argument. Uh, it was never meant to destroy them. It was meant to protect them. Now, again, TJ, it worked horribly. So I can't, nobody can defend that. But his motives, I think, in the origins were not bad. Um, and he was pretty shocked by what happened as well. So, you know, it's not a great answer, but at the same time, he was never out to commit genocide. That was just not his policy. It is interesting. If you look back at, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who had supposed that it might be better if they had repatriated slaves back to Africa. And his arguments and reading why he thought that was a good idea, that this is kind of in the same vein, isn't it? That he's looking at these people and saying, if they're going to survive, if they're cultured yeah. and, they're, and they're going to prosper and flourish, we have to yeah. do something drastic. You know, I, I would say the difference is this, TJ. There's definitely a relationship there. But obviously, returning blacks to Africa, that's, that, is so, that would have been so culturally shocking 
to African Americans who had lived here their whole lives and their parents had lived here and so forth. Whereas for the American Indian, at least it's still on similar soil, you know? Um, so I mean, there is a difference, but you're right. They're very similar kinds of ideas. It's, it's me trying to get inside their head. I mean, obviously saying it out oh, loud yeah. now, it sounds yeah. like such a horrible, horrible thing, but I suppose, right. well, that, and, and the thing we don't talk about a lot is I've been reading a lot about the wars between the Indians and the Americans. They were some of the most formidable yeah daunting enemies we'd ever face. We fought them for hundreds of years, and this was kind of the culmination and close of that struggle, right? And it's like, what yeah, do we, what yeah, do, we do now? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's not pretty. There's no question. It is not pretty at all. But I, I'll, I'll throw this in to TJ, and I, I found this fascinating. Not something I knew before I read the book. In his own day and age, Jackson was considered as a moderate to an Indian lover on the spectrum of how Americans thought about Indians. So when he got the Indian Removal Act passed in 1830, it was very expensive. And a lot of whites complained, oh, here's Jackson, the Indian lover, using US tax dollars to give the Indians great land that we would all like in Kansas and Oklahoma. And he obviously hates white people. <laughs> That's how different the view was at the time, you know, if you can imagine. I mean, that's just shocking I, I to can. us now. Well, I mean, you read about Lincoln and the things they said about him, about how he yeah, was— Yeah, right, uh, right, right. It's very similar. Stuff you hear yeah. on the Chappelle show today about how much he loved black people and he was a traitor to his own— I, it's, It is fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. To be a Highlander and be able to live two or three hundred years and, and have been there. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing, and I, I don't mean this, this is going to be so politically incorrect, TJ, but Do it. it's Do also it. when we talk about the Trail of Tears— uh, we always show pictures of the Indians being forcibly removed. All of those pictures are not accurate because the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Creek all owned more black slaves per capita than whites did at the time. So I'm not, that doesn't excuse removal, but it makes the picture a lot more complicated. So nobody depicts them with their slaves walking with them. And yet they took them all to Oklahoma too. So not I'm not that. trying to bash anybody. I just, the picture is more complicated than we often think. I knew that they had a pretty good handle on slavery when we came to America. They were they were very uh, adept at it, but I didn't know they took their yeah. slaves with them. Is oh, there... absolutely. They're on the trail of tears, too. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I wanted to ask about uh, his opposition in American politics. Like, I think it was Henry Clay yeah. who said, Greece had its Alexander, Caesar, Rome had its Caesar. <laughs> we have Andrew Jackson. But yeah, let's, this... let's come back to that. I want to know what else you said you learned that writing the book. What else did you learn that you didn't expect to? Yeah, well, a lot of things. One, I had no idea how much uh, Jackson just loved women. And I, I don't mean that in the sense like you were joking about homophobia sure, earlier. Sure. But I mean, sure. it, I mean, it in the sense that he really respected women. Uh, I, I have never encountered someone outside of the Catholic Church who had a view of women like Catholics often do about Mary. Um, he, he's not a Catholic, but his view of his wife and of his mother and of his neighbors, he just, man, I mean, they were up on a pedestal. They were next to you know, demigods in his mind, uh, which I didn't know. I, thought, I was fascinated by that. But there's no doubt he and Clay and especially he and Calhoun just despised each other. Uh, they were definitely his enemies. And he was actually a good ally of John Quincy Adams until the 1824 election. But yeah, there, there's a lot of political rivalry. And Clay, Calhoun, and Webster all form the Whig Party. They call it Whig because they're they're attacking what they consider to be King Andrew, right? That Jackson was acting too much as a monarch. So yeah, there was a lot of anger there. Was definitely. it Quincy Adams or was it Calhoun? Who was the one he had a... Uh a blood feud with till the day he died over the death of his wife and the dirty politics. Oh, it was, uh, yeah, and for good reason, it was Calhoun. So uh, his wife was a very devout Presbyterian her whole life, uh, really an incredible woman. She was every bit as interesting as he was, and yet nothing's ever been written about her, which I thought was fascinating. But she's intellectual, very intellectual, his equal. She's very astute in terms of politics. But she had been married as a young woman. She had been married before Jackson. And the man she had been married to was an absolute abuser. I mean, he, he not only sexually, but he physically abused her all yeah. the time. And she left him for good reason. And that was unacceptable at the time. You know, it was, uh, to, especially in the Protestant churches, if you were married once, that was it. You couldn't get remarried. And yet she did remarry, married Jackson. So all the arguments that were used against her were always these arguments. She's a used woman. She's a prostitute. 
which was not uncommon at the time to make that argument. But of course, you know, she had every right to leave her first husband. And so a lot of tracks, a lot of political political arguments. I'm sorry, you guys, the train's going by. I can't help that. You're probably picking that up right now. As long as it's not uh, your train. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> I'm glad they're still running. Actually, it means something's happening with the economy. But anyway, um, uh, so Jackson's wife, that all these articles have been written about her. These I'm just crazy. There were books written about what you know, Jackson had married a prostitute and she's a woman of ill repute. And she had refused to read any of those. And in 1828, right after Jackson had been elected, she went into Nashville to do the Christmas shopping. She left the Hermitage, their plantation went into Nashville to do the Christmas shopping and she encountered one of these pamphlets, which she'd never read. And you know, no exaggeration, TJ, she picked it up, started reading it. She had a heart attack in the middle of the Nashville street and she died four days later. Uh, that's, and so that's why Jackson wow. never, ever forgave his opponents because he was convinced. I mean, he goes, he then has to go to DC without a wife, I mean, his best friend. And that's why at the inaugural, he's wearing all black. He wears black for a year in the White House because he's so, and he never gets over his wife's death. They are best friends. Uh, so he, yes, he's resentful to the day he dies. Absolutely resentful. Fascinating. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I mean, here, you know, we love to put these guys in the abstract, but then we start looking at their lives. Their lives are as complicated as ours are you know, in every way. These are real people. Uh, I don't know how we can top that. Is there anything else that you learned about Jackson that surprised you? <laughs> That's I, oh, Well, that also hits yeah. my heartstrings. I'm thinking about if that happened to my wife. I'm not Andrew Jackson, but I'd be out. Someone would have to go. Yeah, someone's got to pay for that. I agree. Um, you know, the only other thing that I thought was hilarious, and this this goes back to your comments on the Southern character. Yeah. There was a when, the first time he was in the Senate, it was, uh, I can't remember the exact dates. I think it was 1798 and 99. It may have been 99 and 1800. I can't remember, but just right there at the end of the 1790s. And there were two guys who spent six weeks on the floor arguing about the same thing. And Jackson finally said, if you two were men, you would have settled this in one afternoon and one of you would be dead. The other would win and you would not have wasted millions of dollars of public money. <laughs> so that's, you know, that was his answer to everything. Just shoot it out. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of fits with the stereotype. But I thought that was pretty funny. It wasn't my intention to make the obvious comparisons to Trump, but hopefully people can uh, kind of deduce that from our conversation. And I really hope they yeah. run and get the book. It's in defense of Andrew Jackson. This is Dr. Bradley Berzer. And uh, I don't know, have you written any more? This is the first book of yours that I've read. Do you have any other, any other works that can? Oh, Russell yeah, Kirk no, book? thanks for asking, TJ. Um, it's actually my shortest book by far. I have, uh, I wrote biographies, I've written biographies of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, one of the signers of the Declaration, and uh, Russell Kirk, the founder of post-war conservatism, and uh, Christopher Dawson. <laughs> So who's a, a Catholic, English Catholic historian. So, yeah, and I, I, um, I wrote a book of the drummer of Rush, Neil Peart. So Interesting. <laughs> it's mostly biographies all over the place. I'll have a hard time Pop deciding where to progressive start. Progressive rock, you know. Well, I'll link to your <laughs> Amazon. I can get away with. I'll link to your Amazon so. author page. And uh, no, I like that this one's short. Thank I'm you. big into pictures and uh, short books. It's been, but no, it's a fantastic book. I joke. Uh, Thank you so run out much, and grab CJ. it. If you want to learn more about interaction, the contextual history of what was happening around the time that he became uh, one of our, in the eyes of Dr. Berzer, one of our great presidents. And I love that you mentioned some of your friends don't agree with you at all because um, that's what this is oh, all no. about. Oh, no. No, definitely not. And they're legitimate debates, certainly. So I'm in the minority, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope everyone enjoyed Thanks. the chat. We'll, it was uh, wonderful talking to you. Right. Yeah, thank you. See you soon.